The concept of game preservation has been a bit of a hot topic in recent years. From companies like Nintendo being exceptionally strict when it comes to emulating or accessing games that aren't publicly accessible on their current consoles, to even companies like Night Dive Studios resurrecting cult classics like Blood, Power Slave, or Turok. But at the same time, when it does come to the subject matter, most people mention it in regards to single player games, not so much when it comes to multiplayer games. I don't think it's controversial to say that multiplayer shooters aren't exactly in the best place right now. Not that they're unsuccessful or anything, they're probably more popular than they have ever been, but despite all of that, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone saying much positive nowadays, not helped all the more by how hyper competitive the genre is, leaving little room for any new names. I already made a whole video on that subject, so I won't repeat myself much here. But much like disgruntled gamers disappointed with a recent AAA game go back to a single player game of the past for enjoyment, I've been recently going back to some older multiplayer games to scratch that itch recent games haven't as of late. Quake Champions was already one of those games, but recently, another old classic has been taking up quite a bit of both me and my friend's time. Just what can I say about Team Fortress 2? It's the multiplayer game I spent the most hours on back in high school, and revisiting it even 16 years after its release just cements all the more in my mind that it's still one of the best shooters ever made. The airtight base design of the nine classes ensure they all have a distinct role and encourage teamwork and cooperation to the highest degree. And the addition of unlockable weapons create even more personalization of one's playstyle and in turn create near infinite replayability. There's always something new to master in TF2, from practicing your timing on demo night charges, utilizing rocket and sticky jumping to flank and gain the upper hand against your enemies, to even playing the maximum amount of mind games as the spy to take out high priority targets. Combine this with all the maps and game modes added throughout the years ensuring there's always something fresh to play, the iconic art style, the goofy tone and characters, and it's no surprise that after all this time, it still has a dedicated community and continues to be one of Steam's most played games, consistently being in the 70 to 100k range. In nearly every piece of promotional material and even on the game's official website, you always see that quote from PC Gamer saying how it's the most fun you can have online, and I honestly think that statement still holds some weight all these years later because all the aforementioned ingredients for TF2 just mixed perfectly, and ended up creating a truly timeless game. Many have tried, and even have come close to imitating its success, but there really is no other game that can just offer a goofy, yet skillful cooperative experience that TF2 does. To this day, even after a decade, there's just no other game like it. It's in a complete league of its own. And sure, not everything is perfect. Some weapons are either absolutely overpowered or downright useless, random crits are still far from fair and balanced, that sniper with a hail zone will still headshot you with pinpoint precision even when you keep moving constantly as the fastest class in the game, but really that's all minor at the end of the day because despite everything, I can load up a match on Viaduct or Upward and know I'm at least in for something of a good time even if we do get steamrolled. It's just a game that's enjoyable no matter what, and for me, that matters the most at the end of the day. Team Fortress 2, 15 years later, is still a joy to play, and is a breath of fresh air in a sea of samey, bland multiplayer shooters. But if you know TF2 even just slightly, you probably have an idea of what I'm going to talk about next. This is not good. <laughs> Now, I know what you're probably wondering. Cat, aren't you three years late to this topic? Yes, but I don't play every game all the time and I've only recently gotten back into TF2, so shut up. And yes, I did technically talk about this in a video last year, but I boiled it together with Titanfall 2, which honestly wasn't really the best idea looking back since, while they do share some similarities, they are both very different circumstances at the end of the day. So consider this me giving TF2 the time it deserves regarding the situation. Now, TF2 has always had a bit of a cheating problem. 
Even back in 2014 or so, you would encounter the occasional Lamau box user or wall hacker, but in most cases they would be at the mercy of the Vogue kick pretty fast if the opposing team had any dignity. But the issue has evolved since then. TF2 doesn't have just a cheating problem anymore, but a botting problem. If you're unaware of the circumstance already, the trend nowadays is that instead of actual players behind cheating accounts, it's AI programmed to act a certain way during games. In most cases, they'll usually play Sniper and spinning bot while Spike spamming music, alongside spamming a text bind advertising the hack AI in question. Some of these accounts will also advertise a bot immunity service too, which I'm pretty sure doesn't even work and it's just a scam. Now, if it's just one bot in a server filled with other players, it's usually not a big deal most of the time, and most teams will vote kick near instantly once they notice. But these bots have ways to combat this as well. For one, when they get vote kicked, they'll sometimes have a text bind telling people that they're not a bot, confusing people and getting some who haven't been paying attention to the match to mistakenly vote no. But even worse, if these bots are smart, they'll tend to queue up together in one party and try to fill servers up with each other, and vote kick any real players the moment they join. And this isn't even getting into some of the other hacks that have been popping up as of late, such as crit toggles or bots for other classes like Heavy or Scout. Needless to say, this entire circumstance can make finding clean servers a real gamble, since in most cases you're better off just requeuing if there's more than four bots in a server. And in some lesser played game modes and maps like in the miscellaneous playlist, there's a very low chance you'll find any actual playable lobbies unless your name is Degroot E. Now, it's worth noting that the bot situation is a lot better compared to how it was back in 2020. Valve has made some small tweaks to how matchmaking and text chat work for free-to-play players, and in turn, we have seen a drastically smaller amount of bots ruining lobbies. But at the same time, they haven't been eliminated entirely so it's still a damn coin flip in terms of whether you'll find an actual playable lobby or not. And again, this is only worth saying for the core game modes that are the most populated, like King of the Hill, Payload, Control Points, Attack Defense, and CTF. Anything else, like Manpower, Pastime, and the Miscellaneous Playlist is free game, and it's rare, if not downright impossible, to find playable lobbies in certain cases. Hell, here in the East Coast, I find that bots come out even more after midnight, making most if not every lobby, depending on your luck, near unplayable, like one of those crappy YouTube clickbait challenge videos. Look, I'm willing to give Valve somewhat the benefit of the doubt here, since they've announced recently that they are looking at the workshop again for content to put into a future summer update, and it's clear that most of their resources right now are hyper-focused on shipping Counter-Strike 2 in June, so it's definitely a matter of time until this issue improves somewhat. And solving the bot crisis isn't as simple as just IP banning or upgrading TF2's version of VAC either. There's a really good video by Shonik that I highly recommend you give a watch as it goes over a number of possible solutions and why most of them unfortunately either wouldn't work or are exactly ideal. But at the same time, I can't help but find it frustrating how it's night and day when you look at other Valve run games like CSGO. If you queue for casual or even comp in that game, you'll have next to no issue with cheaters whatsoever, and even CS2 is seemingly set to get further updates as to how VAC works. And I get too, Valve is rather small for what they do. They're only around 300 plus employees as of February. But these guys make ungodly amounts of money. Not even just from Steam, CSGO, or even the Steam Deck, but from TF2 itself still. It's the 40th highest profitable game on Steam, which might not sound like much at a glance, but when you factor in just how many games are available on Steam, it's kind of a big deal. People still spend lots of money on this game. I've been spending money on this game. You bet your ass I'm actually going to try and swag out my characters and play MVM for rewards now that I'm not a poor high school kid anymore. When one of your main profit generators is a gamble to actually play, and can be downright unplayable depending on the hour of day or what mode you queue up for, that's kind of a problem. The core, intended TF2 experience is getting harder by the day to truly preserve, and while it's still playable in some aspects, Valve isn't the only company that has struggled with making some of these classics playable in the current year. Accessibility matters a lot too. How many of you all have heard of a little game called Quake Live? Quake Live has a bit of a complex history. To put it simply, it was an updated HD version of id's Quake 3 Arena, completely free to play and browser based, with all the content added from the Team Arena expansion and even new maps and game modes next to old returning ones from previous Quake games. 
Sounds awesome, right? Well, unfortunately, in the modern Quake tradition, it was not to players liking design-wise at launch. QL initially launched with a loadout system, and I don't mean the way Quake Champions does nowadays where it was just less powerful versions of specific weapons. It shipped with a system where you could spawn in a game with some of the most crucial and powerful weapons in Q3's arsenal, like the rocket launcher, lightning gun, or railgun. As you can imagine, this completely botched the balance of the game, as not only were Q3's maps designed with pickups in mind and finding powerful weapons as you spawn, but also depending on the type of map, people would just pick the most useful weapon and abuse it to hell. If you're on a really close quarters map, people would just spam the rocket launcher for easy kills, and on a wider map, people would just spam the lightning gun or railgun. It completely ruined the balance of Quake 3's core gameplay, and in turn, it was eventually removed. But alongside that, what especially didn't help the game's success was the way the game tried to monetize itself. Quake Live was free to play, but decided to bring in its profits through web-based and in-game advertising, which initially didn't bring in as much as they hoped. Not helped either by the advertising agency it teamed up with struggling financially at the time. In response to this, in 2010, a subscription mod was introduced to the game. I really wonder what breakout success could have possibly caused that. For $2 a month, you'd be given access to 20 exclusive maps, the freeze tag game mode, and the ability to create and join up to 5 clans. Alongside this, there was a pro option where for $4 a month, you would get everything the previous tier offered, alongside the ability to host your own server. Naturally, barely anyone bought into these servers. The exclusive content wasn't exactly an enticing grab for people, and the ability to server host seemed redundant to most players since they could easily just find whatever servers they wanted to play on already. Even for the cheap price, it felt like gating off features that were standard back in 1999, and most of the player base just didn't want to budge for it. It were out of options for trying to make a profit off of Quake Live, and despite the Steam release of the game injecting new life in a new player base, the game still didn't gain the subscription numbers like they wanted. Just a year later in 2015, the game would receive its final update, not only migrating the game's infrastructure from its own proprietary account system to Valve Steamworks API and adding Steam Workshop support, but also completely dropping the subscription model, reverting the game from free to play to a price tag of $10. <laughs> this simple move effectively killed Quake Live. Sure, it was a sinking ship already in terms of profits, but the game was still accessible as ever to anyone, and the free-to-play price tag ensured that people of all skill levels would be consistently playing. Look, I get it, gaming is a business at the end of the day. This shit costs money, and QL simply didn't pull in the profits it needed to sustain itself. I totally understand why they did this, but I honestly can't help but wish they just left the game as it was. Sure, the player counts would have likely dipped, as do most multiplayer games over time, but the free entry point would have still ensured a consistent flow of players. Some people were questioning why I, and by extension people like Gianni, were advocating for Quake Champions as the game to revive arena shooters, and not something more faithful like Xenotic or Diabotical. And that's simply just because those games are not as easily available as QC is. Quake Champions is not only free, meaning anyone can download and play it, but is on the platform most PC gamers use already. You have to go out of your way to download Xenonic on the official website, and Diabotical is only available on, let's face it, an unconventional platform that most people don't want to touch unless they play Fortnite already, contributing to its exceptionally low player count. Of course, Quake Live is still playable. In fact, if you played it during the free-to-play period, check your Steam library. There's a good chance it's still there and you can download and play it. But it's less accessible than ever since not only are populated servers on the East Coast with a decent ping a rare sight to see, but the ones that are populated and have decent ping both contain way too many people for the game mode in question, and also contain nothing but veterans that will inevitably curb stomp anyone who dares to join. And like I've said before, that's not their fault for being so good, but the paywall basically means that the remaining player base is contained to their high skill level, and anyone new who does decide to play the game is going to be put off rather fast with no servers being catered for beginners. And I'm sure people are going to ask, why not just play normal Quake 3? More people are probably playing it anyways, and I don't doubt that for a second. But the problem is, unfortunately, it's not exactly easy to get working how you would want out of the box in 2023. More specifically, running this game in a source port like IO Quake 3 with widescreen console command stretches out the HUD and, unless I'm blind, I can't find any way to make it look normal. 
IORTCW, a fork made specifically for Return to Castle Wolfenstein, has a console command that fixes this, but to my knowledge isn't available in IO Quake 3. Quake Live is just more accessible right out of the box. Maybe you have to use one console command to make sure the game renders in full screen properly, but otherwise you could just start playing instantly. It's just a shame no one else other than veterans seems to want to play it. Now, you're probably also asking, why not just run your own server? And yes, that is a good way to preserve the experience of these games in theory. Servers like Uncletopia, run by TF2 YouTuber Uncle Dane, have been a haven for TF2 players wanting a bot-free experience. But unfortunately, there's a lot of problems involving these as well. For one, it's not guaranteed that vanilla servers will get any traction in the first place, especially compared to modded servers, which are inherently more appealing to people. The reason Uncletopia even took off in the first place is not only due to TF2's near-unplayable state back in 2020, but also Uncle Dane's pre-existing large audience, which he fully admits to. Now, this is the part where I would definitely suggest that more people do what I did and start their own TF2 community server that is easily self-sustaining and consistently populated, but I know that's totally unrealistic and easier said than done. So I'll just go ahead and admit it, I just so happen to be uniquely situated in a position where I can host TF2 servers. The money I make from my TF2 videos is more than enough to manage server costs, not to mention I receive the occasional donation for keeping them running despite donations never being required and providing zero benefit for doing so. I have have a large enough audience to where I can get the ball rolling for populating the servers, and word of mouth combined with people just joining from the server browser when Uncletopia inevitably floats to the top of the list keeps them full. And I just so happen to already be longtime friends with people who not only were interested in server administration, but who are well equipped to manage a server array of the size that it's grown to. So yeah, I'm definitely at a massive advantage over any regular Joe when it comes to setting up and hosting your own TF2 server community. These two factors not only supplied the desire most players already had beforehand, but also ensured that there was an easily accessible audience for the server. Even early on, when there were only a few Uncletopia servers, Dane and John couldn't keep up with the demand, as the servers were consistently full. Name value and branding matters a lot, and unfortunately no one is going to join some random guy's vanilla server in a sea of others that are likely more appealing to people. Recently, id Software and Bethesda decided to create vanilla dedicated servers for Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, with the new attention being drawn to it via its Steam release, which is a great idea and concept to not only bring in new players, but also preserve the intended Day 1 experience. Yet every time I look, not only do they barely show up in the in-game server list, but when they do, they're nearly empty most of the time. What also contributes to this is that most of the community around enemy territory nowadays don't play the vanilla release, but rather E.T. Legacy, an open source modification that aims to fix bugs and bring the game up to modern standards. While id and Bethesda's gesture with these servers have good intentions, it unfortunately just doesn't work with the current state of the E.T. community. Alongside all of that, server browsing in of itself isn't exactly ideal for new players. Anyone new to TF2 who just installed the game for the first time isn't immediately going to go to the server browser, they're going to click on the first option they see, which is the casual matchmaking. That, and while I and others are able to handle the server browser fine nowadays, there's no chance that people who aren't familiar with TF2 or older PC games are not going to feel totally overwhelmed by this prehistoric behemoth of a menu wave. There's a reason most shooters nowadays ditch servers in place of normal matchmaking, and that's just because server browsers, while offering an unlimited amount of choice on what to play, are just too overwhelming and don't give enough information for new players. And in the case of Uncletopia, Dane admits that, while not completely tryhard, the audience of the server is intended for those who already have a bit of experience in the game, so it's not the best place for new players to learn either. But above all else, the biggest reason that servers just aren't ideal is not only do they cost money, which is counterproductive when you consider that games like TF2 have a matchmaking system that should work by default, but also... Just look at all this shit! Do you really expect me or any other person new to PC gaming to know how all of this works right off the bat? I've been playing PC games for almost a decade now and even I don't know what half of this means. There's a reason services like Bisect Hosting, Shockbite, and even Mojang's own Realm service exist for hosting Minecraft servers. Because it's simply just easier to have someone else do all this for you and all you need to do is pay a few bucks a month to keep it up. Gamers just don't have the patience to go through all this work for themselves when they could just be spending that time playing the game that they want to play. 
ease of access matters a lot to the people who just want to play the game that they already paid for. One of the smartest decisions id and Night Dive made for the recent Quake remaster was giving players the ability to not only host public servers manually like how you would back in the day, but also create smaller lobbies people could join by a four-digit code. No need to port forward or anything else, just send a code to the people you want and start your lobby. Combine this with the ability to host cross-platform servers between PC and consoles, and you're more or less guaranteed that a good amount of people will be consistently playing. It's unlikely considering how many other projects Night Dive have on their play currently, but I would genuinely love to see a re-release of Quake 3 on the Kex engine with the same lobby system that the Quake 1 remaster has, combined with the workshop support Live has to guarantee that there's always something new and fresh to play. But I bet you're probably also asking, don't those games all have dedicated server support? And yeah, you're right. The dreaded always online live service game has been seeing some drastic casualties as of late. From Rumbleverse to Knockout City to even Square and Crystal Dynamics Avengers, it's clear that every game with an always online infrastructure is doomed to fade away at some point or another, doubly so if they end up flopping with low player numbers. And while Knockout City and Avengers will still remain playable, be it through private servers or through console services like XBL and PSN respectively, these not only are very lucky cases that just aren't frequent nowadays, but they also have major caveats to them. Avengers still has its own single player mode and can technically still live on through physical copy, sure, but the hands-off approach to multiplayer servers ultimately means that at a certain point, once these consoles' online services shut down, so too will those games. And even in the case of Knockout City, it's rare in general that any game gets dedicated server support nowadays, let alone if it's shutting down or not. The last game I can remember getting anything close to that was Halo MCC, and even that's mostly just for custom games, as most of the vanilla experience is relegated to the standard matchmaking system. Even Quake Champions isn't fail-proof for if and when it gets shut down one day. Everything in the game requires connection to the Bethesda Net server, including private matches, solo or not. Let me repeat, you need an internet connection if you just want to play solo with bots. That's both embarrassing and scary. But while games like Rumbleverse and QC carry the absolute worst case scenario, I want to focus for a moment on a series that, while its fans have made some strides in preserving the multiplayer experience, it still isn't completely perfect. Call of Duty. For as much as I do love the series, it's no secret that COD is the most disposable FPS franchise on the planet. While the annual structure means that there's a constant stream of variety in what kind of experiences come out, it unfortunately means that, in most cases, every new game outshines the last, and while they might not completely die out, player numbers do take a hit, and they will continue to get lower and lower as the years go by. Every COD multiplayer's time to be completely playable front to back is limited, and the lack of decade server since 2009 with Modern Warfare 2 have only exacerbated the issue. And sure, these games are still more than playable on consoles nowadays, due in no short part to Xbox's backwards compatibility program. But both the age of the game and the servers means that nowadays, it's a hacker's playground on consoles, and it's hard to get into a normal, proper lobby like you would want. Now of course, not everything is lost here. Projects like Plutonium and IW4X have added dedicated server support for some of the most iconic and beloved entries in the COD series, ensuring that they still will be playable. But there's another problem that lies here. Progression. Not only is it rare that progression will consistently work with these custom clients, but the console being completely unlocked means that most will opt to just use the unlock all command so that they can have everything. And I don't blame anyone who does do that for the record. Sometimes you just want a quick fix in nostalgia and you'd rather just unlock all the weapons so you can remake your class you used back in the day and jump right in. That's totally fine. If you grind it already back on console, I don't blame you for not wanting to go through the entire unlock process all over again. But the problem is that not only does it create a severe difficulty curve between those who just want to progress normally compared to those who just use the unlock all command, but using it in these games unlocks absolutely everything. Max prestige, mastery camos for every weapon, absolutely every box and challenge ticked. Meaning that there's nothing to aim for, no goal to reach. When the finish line is already reached, there's no reason for me to play aside from a quick reminder of the good old days. Not helped by how, once again, the progression systems either don't work or are incredibly buggy with saving progress. 
The only custom client I've had the best luck with regarding keeping progression intact is the H1 mod for the COD 4 remaster. Since not only does the playing field feel much more even just with how COD 4 is balanced, but also the way you can earn black market weapons is still engaging and gives players something to aim for even after prestige and getting camo challenges, as you'll get currency you can use towards these weapons and cosmetics just by playing. It's a really good way to keep the progression intact while also just adding more onto it. It's just too bad that no one fucking plays it and I'm really pissed because it's really fun and much better than what kind of shit Infinity War is trying to do right now. Look, I get why single player games have gotten the most focused when it comes to game preservation. It's just easier and overall less complicated save for maybe dealing with rights issues. And aside from maybe general re-releases and better support, even I don't have a concrete solution to this issue. Hell, I'm only scratching the surface here with this topic. There are many other situations with games like Destiny 2 or World of Warcraft that I just didn't have enough time to get into. But not only do multiplayer games still deserve to be preserved as much as single player games, but these games mean a lot to people. Not only were games like TF2 the jumpstart to so many people's creative careers and cultivated a lot of long-lasting friendships, but it shaped and influenced not just the shooters we see today, but so many of people's tastes in games, period. Quake Live was my introduction to arena shooter. It is my favorite multiplayer shooter ever. Yes, even more than TF2. And to see that game in the state that it's in nowadays being nearly impossible for someone like me to play without some kind of issue really hurts. Maybe sooner or later things will get better. With the rising demand for more movement-based shooters, perhaps it's only a matter of time before some of these classics get a proper re-release like Quake 1 did. But that's only considering if developers are even willing to take the risk to resurrect these games in the first place. Single player games can exist in their own bubble, without the need of constant attention from the media, but yet most people don't see multiplayer games the same way. The audience exists for it, I and so many others are all for it, but I fear that developers don't feel the same way. I can only hope that I'm proven wrong. But if you're gonna do nothing else, at least make it so you can't get a match on the same map twice in a row, Valve. I love Harvest, but I am so tired of playing on it because these so-called free thinkers won't stop voting for it already. <laughs>